Yes, shalom everyone. This is Amir Tsarfati and I'm here live from Galilee, from Israel. It is rainy, it is snowing uh, in different parts of the country. Winter is definitely here as so many of you across the globe can feel, especially in Europe and the United States right now, very, very uh, strong in uh, unprecedented uh, winter uh, uh, storms in different parts of the world. We Israelis, we long for snow, we love rain, and we, you know, we don't get that that often. And the snow uh, blizzard that we got on the Golan is something we've seen only maybe 10 years ago. The Sea of Galilee is almost at its uh, top level. Probably after this system, it will reach that level and uh, we're going to have to open the dam and allow the water to flow out of the Sea of Galilee further down the Jordan River. Hey, before we move to a super important Middle East update, we need to start with prayers. So, Father, we thank you so much that you know the end from the beginning and therefore we can speak today on things that are yet to uh, to happen or you know, yet to come, yet we can speak with confidence because it is written in your word and your word is truth. Your word is that which we need to sanctify ourselves with. And so we ask you to help us understand the times and the seasons in which we live and to comfort us in these very dark and evil days that you are in full control and that your soon return to take your children out of here is actually our, definitely our, de our blessed hope. We thank you and we bless you and we ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Shalom, everyone. Again, this is Amir Tsalfati live from Galilee, from Israel. There is so much that I want to talk to you about, but I will start with the latest thing, ladies and gentlemen, the latest thing that just uh, happened in the last few hours, and then we're going to move back to how things progress. So, ladies and gentlemen, for the first time since Russia entered into uh, Syria, for the first time, Russia is withdrawing its forces from one of the air bases and I'm talking about the uh, the T4. And, and um, guess what? Less than 24 hours. That happened yesterday. Less than 24 hours after that one. 22 trucks and, uh, and um, I guess, uh, vans of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. They entered that airbase and took over Iran took over a Syrian airbase that has been evacuated yesterday by the Russians. And uh, we're going to talk about how Putin is in trouble right now and what is going on and how the current administration in the United States is basically um, emboldening the uh, Iranians to move forward uh, with full force. So let me show you something very interesting that you may want to see. And this is Ladies and gentlemen, this is what uh, the American and the Russian presence in Syria today look like. And I need you to see that the, there is the Euphrates River, excuse, excuse me, the, the, yeah, the Euphrates, and you can clearly see beyond the Euphrates, there is more the Kurdish area and, and the area that there is a heavier American presence there. And many of those who left Iraq when... Uh, the former president of the United States pulled them out. They moved to the northeastern part of the country of Syria. And now I want you to see the rest of Syria is full of Russian forces. And you can see one of them is in Tayas. Take a look. There is an airbase called Tayas. Tayas, also known as T4. And this is the airbase that had been evacuated yesterday. It was so fast that the Russians packed their things and left. And less than 24 hours later, Iran Revolutionary Guards, they moved in. And uh, I'm telling you, it's going to be a very interesting uh, weekend ahead of us as far as Israel is concerned. 
When we saw all of this happening, Israel, I guess, got a warning from Russia they are going to do that. Israel launched a an exercise, a war game or an exercise that was planned for next week known as Galilee, the Rose of Galilee. It's funny how they find those names, Rose of Galilee, but that tells you that um, it, it is about the Northern Front and about defending Galilee, of course. Even the Lebanon War that started in 1982 started as a an, an military operation called Peace for Galilee, Shlom HaGalil, the Peace of Galilee. So here we are watching an Israeli, and the, the, for 48 hours, Israeli jets were flying nonstop. I live right next to the northernmost airbase of Israel's Air Force. Um, it's Ramat David, and uh, man, every few minutes, takeoff and landing, and the way they were flying up and down, and they assimilated a war and uh, a military operation against targets um, that are attacking Israel from the north. Uh, from, from not just Syria, but also from Lebanon. And that is because we are watching the emboldening of not only Iran's forces in Syria, but also Iran's proxies in Lebanon. And Nasrallah just gave yesterday's speech where he warned the Israelis that if they cross the line, they will watch worse things than we had in 1948. And of course, Israel... Uh, replied with its own language, saying that um, every day, if there will be a new operation, every day there will be 300 Hezbollah casualties. So he better watch what he's saying. And it's very interesting, all of that happening when actually the current administration in America is not talking about anything but negotiations with Iran. It's very interesting. You need to understand when you move to diplomacy only, Diplomacy might be a solution for a, uh, the Western world, but it, in some dictatorships such as Iran, it's not a solution. It's a means to reach what they really want. And so right now, the bazaar, the Persian bazaar had begun. And of course, how do you, how do you get everything you want? You apply pressure outside from all directions. And that is, of course, what leads me to what happened on Sunday. Just a few days ago, Sunday night in Iraq, on the northern eastern part of Iraq, in Erbil, in the Kurdish area. And let me, let me show you a map, more or less, so you can see on the very, very top um, Erbil area, um, um, well, that's probably not the best map, but I, I want I want you to know, guys, that um, um, Iranian militias launched fourteen rockets that hit a U.S. base. Well, it's a base of coalition forces that is headed by the U.S. and it is right next to the city of Erbil. It's at the international airport of the Kurdish autonomous area of Erbil, and a U.S. citizen, a contracting, a contractor worker died. Another U.S. soldier was uh, wounded and five more wounded people. Now, for far less than that, former president of the United States killed uh, Soleimani. Um, this strike, and by the way, you can see uh, what's left from some of the base. These are three different pictures. So you can see a lot of destruction over there as a result of those 14 rockets that were flying. One of the vehicles, there were several vehicles that were um, driving and launching those rockets uh, was attacked eventually, and that's what's left from it. But I want you to know that information that we received today from the Gulf indicates that it was a well-orchestrated operation of Iran itself there was a UAV, a drone that was escorting that truck with the launchers. And um, it, it basically was watching everything that is happening. And of course, left the area back to Iran. Ladies and gentlemen, America said we cannot really do anything because we need to find out who is behind it. It's funny because everybody knows who is behind it. 
they came up with a new organization in northern, uh, as if uh, uh, in Iraq, that's supposed to be a Shia organization that is vowing to kick all the Americans out of Iraq. Um, nobody heard about them before. This is obviously something that they put together just for the sake of a cover up for an Iranian operation. And it's very interesting because, ladies and gentlemen, the weak, um, very weak uh, response of America. Uh, believe it or not, but um, what America said is the following thing. The administration said um, that diplomacy is above everything. They said diplomacy is above everything. Uh, we are we are not sure what's going to happen, but we are willing to go and negotiate with Iran. Um, if you want me to remind you what they did last time to uh, US soldiers, I would like to show you an incident from January of 2016. That was just few days before former the 45th president uh, took office. And I'm the 44th president, Obama was still there in office. And a few uh, days before the inauguration, um, we know that two American um, naval boats like this one that you see, two of them entered into Iranian waters and they were captured by the Revolutionary Guard, by, by the Navy, actually, of Iran. And uh, I don't know if you remember that. There were 10 U.S. Uh, sailors there, of which nine were males and one was a female. And uh, this was the picture that a lot of people remember, okay? So this was the picture. You see on the right-hand side, this is the moment they were arrested. On the left-hand side is the moment of uh, humiliation, basically. And you can see how a, a little boy is standing there in, next to you defeated U.S. sailors. 18 hours later, they were released. But it was important for the Iranians to show the world that they humiliated America. And that was, ladies and gentlemen, that was months after the Iran deal was signed. And that was, of course, led by the U.S. John Kerry was still the Secretary of State at the time. He made so many phone calls to his best friend, Zarif, who dragged him through the mud. And only 18 hours later, they released him. And of course, the game changed when a new sheriff came in town in on January 20th of 2016. And the Iranians tried. They tried some shenanigans and um, they never tried again because the response was decisive and strong when, when the head of the Al-Quds force was, of course, decapitated uh, the head of the snake. Well, that snake was decapitated in Suleimani was, of course, killed on January of 2020, the Iranians understood it is definitely a new sheriff in town. And we and of course, more and more sanctions, the pulling out of the Iran deal. It was the worst four years to Iran. And right now, when they hear, hey, guys, we're gonna, we want to do business with you. We want to go back to the Iran deal. Diplomacy is above all. We do not believe in uses of force. We believe in human rights. We believe in, in dialogues. You know, this is all they want to hear. Why? Because the Iranians are now going to apply more and more pressure, kill more and more civilians, knowing that America is not going to send troops to have more war uh, America will prefer to run to a diplomatic solution and, and that's what they're banking on. I'm not sure it's going to work for them. All I know is one thing. The Iran of January of 2021 is not the, the Iran of January of 2020. And you know what I'm talking about. And make no mistake, folks. I showed you a map of um, the Iranian, the, um, basically American versus the Russian forces in Syria. But I would like to show you a, a different map that will enable you to understand how many more forces we have there, mostly Iranians. Take a look, guys. Although it's from 2017, 
it's it still gives you an understanding. And by the way, today there are even more Iranian strongholds. But take a look, folks, at what we're looking at. This is um, take a look at the American side beyond the Euphrates, of course. But I want you to see, ladies and gentlemen, how many Iranian flags, the dots with Amer Iranian flags are closer and closer to Israel. And I want you to see how many of them are just spread all around. I mean, the Turks are in the north. America is on the northeast. Russia is spread all around. But the, every place Russia leaves, Iran takes over. Make no mistake. Make no mistake. The minute Russian troops will not be any longer in the suburbs and the city of Damascus, you already know who's going to take over there. And this is why the theme of this update is, of course, woe to Damascus. We're going to talk about what the Bible says and, of course, what we know. So the Israeli military understands, Israel understands, uh, Russia is, uh, I mean, there's a different administration, of course, that is appeasing Iran on one hand in America. And, of course, by the way, Joe Biden called uh, Netanyahu finally yesterday and they talked. Um, not sure how um, well it uh, it's going to be in the future, but all I know is that uh, almost a month after the inauguration, uh, he finally did it. Um, but I do want you to know that um, we are watching some escalation in the northern part of Israel because we are watching hesitation and withdrawal from of of, of the Russian troops. And immediately, Iran, uh, and Iranian forces are filling in, and there is absolutely no void over there. Now, let me make it very clear. Vladimir Putin is not doing well right now. It has to be very clear that, uh, you know, Putin had some sort of an agreement with the Russians uh, years ago. I will stabilize Russia after the mess of the drunkard Yeltsin, the chaos that was there, I will stabilize Russia. I will finally elevate your, your life, your um, income, and I'll, I'll bring dignity back to Russia. However, you're not, this is not going to be a democracy. I mean, I will take some of your freedoms, but in return, I will make you happier. And of course, the Russians realize that. And this is, by the way, they forgive him for all of his all of his deals with oligarchs and with billionaires that he obviously takes commission from. And uh, the Russians understand this is not really a, a, a the most uh, honest and 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 in pure administration. There's a lot of corruption going on there. But the Russians didn't care much as long as their life is okay. Then came, of course, um, this whole madness of taking over more territory. It started with 2014 uh, 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 with the Crimea in Ukraine. It continued with 2015 entering into, um, into Syria and now into Libya as well. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, the Russians are not getting flowers back home. They're getting coffins back home. They're getting more and more and more Russian soldiers getting killed there. And uh, it's really hitting their economy. If that's not enough, when he started all of that, oil prices were at $100 a barrel, $140 a barrel. They already dumped all the way to $20, $40, and maybe $60. But these are prices where the Russian economy is actually losing money uh, and not making money here. I mean, you make money when it's above that one. So the biggest industry is actually losing money and is bleeding. And if that's not enough, came COVID. And uh, we're talking about uh, over, I mean, they say 400,000 people uh, were sick uh, or are sick at the moment. Um, there are way more than that. There are way more than 80,000 people that died from that one. And, but, but again, the, 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 the effect of the COVID crisis on the economy, because everything was closed, also um, 
all of these three things brought a very, very, very deep financial economic crisis. And you can clearly see, you can clearly see that uh, this uh, deal that Ru the Russians had with their president is not really going well. I believe that they, they still believe that he can, he's the only one that can rule at the moment, but mm, we're not sure. Now, let me also make it very clear. There's a, a huge wave of anti-Semitism right now in America, in Europe, but also in Russia. Now, let me explain something. The Russian uh, czars, the Romanov family that ruled for 300 years, they were super anti-Semites. And that drove the Jews in Russia to, uh, you know, communism, Marxism. I mean, they, they started it and also were drawn to it, the rest of them. And, uh, and, and of course, um, you know, at the moment, at the moment, and, but, but, but then even communism started producing its own anti-Semitism. And, uh, and it's very interesting, uh, ladies and gentlemen, because now uh, some people blame Putin's corruption on some Jewish billionaires that are supposedly collaborating with him. Now, uh, I want you to know that uh, maybe there is one or two Jewish ones, but most of the others are non-Jewish. So it's not a religious thing. It's a corrupt thing. It's, it's about money that corrupts the people here. But again, as I said, we are talking about a deep crisis, the ruble. Um, it started at the 30 rubles a dollar in 2014. And since then it's losing and then 60 and 80. And now it's about 73 rubles a dollar. I mean, the, the ruble is so weak right now, as you can see, and that is another problem. Look, the Russian military can no longer afford buying the new stealth Jet fighters, Sukhoi 57, that the Sukhoi company is building. Can you imagine American economy is so bad that America can no longer buy the best American aircraft <laughs> and then other countries can? That's what we have. So they are ordering the, the uh, Sukhoi 27, the new version of it, because it's half price or a third of the price. Can you imagine the, the, the flagship industry in, in Russia right now for, for those type of things cannot sell it to its own country because of this thing? Not to mention right now, Putin has a big problem because his Alexei Nevlin, the, the leader of the opposition, exposed so much corruption. One of those things is right on the shores of the Black Sea, Putin built a palace. And I've seen videos of that one in the last few weeks, a palace that worth, um, I don't know, two and a half, uh, I don't know, two and a half billion dollars, maybe even more than that. You're talking about unbelievable size. You're talking about a, a huge hanging bridge that leads you to a tea house. You're talking about underground hockey arena. You're talking about um, you know, a, 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 a re, uh, you know, some amphitheaters for shows. You're talking about, listen, guys, it, it, it's such an extravagant place with a territory of millions of square uh, meters over there uh, with forests all around. And you're not allowed to do anything. You're not allowed to fly. You're not allowed to get closer to it. The Russians, over 112 million views to this YouTube movie on that one, and it was just done in the last few weeks. The Russians are now having second, second uh, thoughts about this whole thing of Putin, and he knows that, folks. And um, so right now, the last thing Putin wants to deal with is appeasing the Shiites, and then, and then you know, uh, there are factions in the military in this in the Syrian military that is for him. Some are against him. Shiites versus Sunnis, uh, Kurds. I mean, he has so much headache from all of this that we can clearly see that in order to concentrate his efforts to win and to do something in Mother Russia, he starts pulling troops out of Syria. And that is exactly what Iran was waiting for him to do. And just that prior to 2015, that Damascus was almost taken over by the rebels, 
And if not, if it wasn't for Putin's arrival, there would be no Assad. I mean, um, there might be a point, ladies and gentlemen. Look, the Iranians are advancing weapons and, uh, and things that are very nasty. And if Israel will feel that uh, Damascus is, is, is going to host that, it's not going to end up well. Look, Syria is a mess. L let me show you something. You may not know that. It, 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 it looks to you like there's only Russians and Americans and Turks there, but it's not the case. Look at this one. Look from how many countries soldiers are f f pouring into Syria from all these Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, and all of that. And, and trust me, there are more. And I'm not even talking about European forces that are joining America, the coalition. It's a mess. And Russia is very tired from all of that. ISIS is hitting them every day in the desert of uh, central uh, Syria right now. There's about eight gigantic pockets of ISIS. Two of them are in Iraq and six of them are in, in Syria right now. They may not have territory, but they do have pockets and they do attack Assad regimes, Iranian uh, militias, and Russian soldiers. Every day, the Russian Air Force is conducting some operations there. But those ISIS uh, terrorists, they can hide in the sand. In the, they just know how to disguise themselves and to, and, and to <laughs> literally resurrect right when uh, they need to hit someone and then poof, disappear again. It's quite remarkable. And so... Why am I telling you all of this? I'm telling you all of this because Israel's eyes, of course, we, we are watching what's going on in Iran and we make sure that the, they will slow down in their attempt to put the, together a bomb. We have no doubt that they are on that track for a bomb. But a bomb by itself is one thing. A, a bomb that they have that is going to be few miles away from us, it's another thing. Now, let me show you what um, Damascus looked like today. I mean, it's a huge city, and it's about 2 million people that live in Damascus. And although you might think, well, after 10 years of civil war, it's probably destroyed, I want to tell you something. I've been watching several YouTubes that were done by travelers who are traveling all around the world, and they came to spend a week or two weeks in, in Syria and a whole day in, in Damascus. Damascus is still a vibrant city with lots of markets, lots of museums, lots of mosques. I mean, maybe the financial situation is not great there, but I mean, it's just packed with people and life. And I need to remind you something. Damascus is considered the oldest continuously inhabited city in the world. You have to understand that. It needs to, I mean, it goes back. We see Damascus mentioned already in ancient hieroglyphic um, writings of the Tel El Amarna um, telling us that, that at least 3,500 years ago during Thotmes III, one of the pharaohs there in, in his conquest of the Middle East, he even mentioned the Mishik. And by the way, some of the things, uh, some one of the names that Damascus is called is Al-Sham. Al-Sham is, is uh, uh, the, the left or the north. The, the eyes of the world in the ancient times were fixed on the east. That's why from the rising of the sun, I mean, it talks about always, that's why we have the term orientation. Let's, let's face ourselves towards the east. Everything should be towards the east. Orient is east. So when you look at the east, what's on the left is north, and that's Al-Sham. And if the east was the desert, if the east was Syria and Babylon, then left north was Damascus, and Damascus was on that road that brought people from Iraq and from Iran, that brought people from Saudi Arabia and all the way. That was just such an important junction. And while Mark Twain, the famous writer, Mark Twain came to Israel 
in the 1800s and actually wrote a horrible report on how desolate this, this place is. <laughs> Let me show you what Mark Twain wrote. Uh, no, excuse me. Uh, this is what Mark Twain wrote. There you go. To Damascus, years are only moments. Decades are only fitting trifles of time. She measures time not by days and months and years, but by the empires she has seen rise and prosper and crumble to ruin. She's a type of immortality. That's Mark Twain. It seems to him then that this city will last forever. This, this city has seen everything. I mean, the, the Egyptian empire and the rise of Assyria and Babylon and Persia and the Medes. And of course, the, um, the, even the Crusaders were there, not to mention the uh, Muslim conquest that made Damascus an important um, seat of government. Um, and uh, for a long time, the house of Umayyah was governing from Damascus. Uh, guys, Damascus has never been utterly, totally destroyed. Never, ever. And why am I saying that? I'm saying that because the Bible is telling us something very interesting. The book of Isaiah says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done. Look, Isaiah says, from ancient time, God is telling us things that are not yet done. And then he says, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. God says, I'm going to tell you of the things that are not yet done, but I want you to know it's, it's, it, I'm, I'm in control. I am in control. And so some of the things that God said through the prophets already took place. But many of the things that God spoke through the prophets are not yet done. And he said, look, guys, I'm going to tell you the end from the beginning. The end from the beginning. Now, if the things of the past were the end, so what are we, what are we doing now here if the end has happened? The end is around the corner, and he's telling us the things of the end. And I want now, of course, to bring you to the famous prophecy of Isaiah 17, verse 1. After I told you that it's a city that has never been utterly destroyed, look what the prophet says. The burden against Damascus. Behold, Damascus will cease from being a city, and it will be what? A ruinous heap. In some other translations, by the way, it says that it can it, it will be uninhabitable, uninhabitable. And why is it so important that we understand that? It's because the Bible is telling us that that oldest continuously inhabited city in the world is going to come to an end. It will no longer be a city. It will no longer be inhabitable. You know, I'm reminded of what just happened a few months ago in Beirut when, when Iran sent to Hezbollah all these ni uh, uh, the uh, nitrate uh, 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 material that uh, exploded there and nearly made Beirut uninhabitable. And the, 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 the devastation was unbelievable. Now, that wasn't weapon. That was the material from which they were supposed to make weapon. What if there is a weapon already that is going to be smuggled into, in, into uh, Damascus when Russians will, will be too tired of being there and being the nanny and the, and the kindergarten teacher between all the factions that are fighting all day long? What if they just turn their blind eye? What if they just say, hey, we have got other things to deal with? What if Iran that we see is out of control right now, what if Iran is going to smuggle into Damascus something that is right there, 70 miles away from Israel? I can, I can, trust me, I can tell you, folks, Damascus will cease from being a city. It will be a ruinous heap. And this is exactly what I believe is going to ignite the Ezekiel 38 and 39 scenario. Why? Because that scenario is involving all those countries that are presently 
running the show in, 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 in the Syrian place that is related to Israel. I mean, you're talking about Turkey and Russia and, of course, Iran that are already there. And you're talking about Turkey and Russia are calling the shots in Libya, each on each side. And, of course, we believe that at some point they'll turn Sudan to join forces with them. Folks, why would Russia, that is now friends with Israel, why would they now turn against us? Once they understand that Syria is a lost case, they cannot really cash anything there. They cannot win the coupons of restoring Syria. Once Damascus will be gone, there is nothing for the Russians to, 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 to gain from it. And remember, Ezekiel's war is all about financial gain. It's not about politics and it's not about religion necessarily. The biblical account is saying that the protest that is coming from the Gulf states and the Saudis, as well as Europe and maybe even America, all the protest will be, have you come to plunder, to take booty? I mean, you are there to loot and to take something from Israel. Obviously, you cannot take it from Syria. I mean, America is right now with the Kurds controlling most of the oil and the gas beyond the Euphrates. And the Russians have no access to it. They tried and it didn't work. Trust me. So what happened is if they turn their back and leave because they, they just they wasted billions of dollars and they made nothing from it. Trust me. If Israel will make any move that will make it clear to the Russians that they have nothing to gain in Syria anymore, they're going to have to gain it somewhere else. And uh, I'm not sure if it's going to be Putin there in power or anyone else that might take over. I know one thing, Rosh will come from the north and it will definitely lead an assault that only God, the, the intensity, the surprise, the way it's coming from the air as a dark cloud, as the Bible says, only God can really stop that from destroying Israel. Israel right now is, is training how to deal with a, a, an attack that will come from different parts. Make no mistake, we've got issues in the south from Gaza. We've got issues in the far south from Yemen that they, they, they have the means to fly UAVs as well as uh, ballistic missiles that can hit southern Israel from Yemen. We've got issues from Lebanon with Hezbollah. We've got, of course, Syria. And uh, Syrians are, by the way, Syria by itself does not really exist. Assad is still there. But when we, want, when we have a problem with Syria, we talk to Putin. Just uh, two weeks ago, an, a 25-year-old Israeli ultra-Orthodox girl uh, I, I guess she's no longer ultra orthodox. She left religion, but somehow she was going through some mental crisis that um, she took off uh, from Israel, probably via Jordan, entered into Syria and was captured. Now, the Syrians in the beginning thought, ooh, Mossad agent, female Mossad agent. When they realized this is a mentally disturbed person, and the price that they asked for it got lower and lower. At first, they thought, wow, we're going to have so many demands. But they realized that they can't ask for more than that. And as of two days ago, Israel decided to release two Syrians uh, that were involved in terrorism and in return get that girl back home. Believe it or not, Syria tried to put a part of this um, deal a point where Israel will say that it will no longer attack in Syria. And Israel said, oh, uh oh, we're not going to sign any paper like that because Israel knows that it will attack in Syria. We're not maybe going to attack the Syrians, but we're going to attack the Iranians. And it will be in Syria. It will be on Syrian soil. And so, woe to you, Damascus. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell now to the two million Syrians that are living right now in Damascus, do not allow the Iranian militias and the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps to enter and take over and run your life because it's, I know how it's going to end up and it's not going to end up well for you. And so folks, 
I mean, you, you, you see how the, the, the less the Russians are involved in Syria, the more the Iranians are. The Iranians don't even hide their plan to destroy Israel and to bring to Israel's, uh, you know, annihilation. Uh, Putin maybe um, is a friend of Israel at the moment, but uh, he's got a lot of problems back home, mostly financial problems. And if he has to choose between staying friends with Israel or taking what Israel has, he will have no problem taking the other option, of course, once he's with his back to the wall. And um, as we know, Damascus never, ever ceased from being a city in the past. It is the oldest continuously inhabited city in the world, which means that after what we just read from Isaiah 46, the prophecy of the utter, complete annihilation of Damascus is still a futuristic one. And as I said, and it is my interpretation only, I believe that that destruction of Damascus is going to lead us to Ezekiel war. And where is the rapture in all of this? Somewhere in between. I believe that that war that we're going to watch is a war where you see the shift moving back to Israel once the church is gone. God is dealing with Israel. God is saving Israel, but unfortunately, they'll choose the wrong Messiah, the Antichrist, of course. Then they'll find out their mistake after, unfortunately, uh, so many of them will receive the mark and they will flee to the desert, according to, uh, of course, um, Revelation 12, where God has a place for them for 1260 days for the latter part of the tribulation. And of course, we know that upon the return of Christ with us, according to Zechariah 12, then they look at him whom they pierced, and they will mourn and cry and repent, basically. And that will make the words of the Apostle Paul to the church in Rome, in Romans 11, so vivid. And as he said, of course, that's when all Israel will be saved. So there's a wonderful end to a terrible story that will begin with that war. And thankfully, we do not have to be part of it. We have a different plan to be somewhere else, to do something else. We've got a date. We've got a wedding to attend. And it's not that we can be late to that wedding or it's not that we can be absent because we are the bride and the we better be there. So I just hope you understand. Unbelievable news. Amazing Bible prophecy. And a horrible process that will lead to a wonderful event at the very end with Israel. But I want to encourage all of you. We are watching things happening. And God is on the throne. He will not be mocked. He will not be ridiculed. And he will not give his glory to anyone. He is on the throne. And if there's one thing that is above his name, it's his word. In other words, his word has to take place, has to happen. Ha the appointed times are set. So don't think that, hey, you know, it's, he's too late. Don't think that, hey, we better be out of here. Um, God knows exactly the moment. And he wants us until then to run, to fight, and to believe. Run the, the race, fight the good fight, and keep the faith. And I want all of us to remember those words that Paul wrote, Timothy. You know, only when he knew that it's that's it. He's about to see the Lord soon. He says, that's when he changed it to past tense. I've run, I've run the race. I finished the race, basically. I fought the good fight. So we are not going to die. We are still in that race. And we have to run as someone is running to win. Because our, our uh, reward is not just something that is fading away. And as we run, we need to look at him 
who sits at the right hand of the Father and interceding for us. He is the target. He is the finish line. Let's continue. Let's encourage one another. Let's put all the energy on spreading the word and living the word rather than dealing with other things that are not bringing glory to God and they're bringing division and strife. And uh, <laughs> look, I always tell people the world has, you know, two parallels. There is the world events and there is our life. World events will happen no matter what. God already said it will happen. Our life, the decision of our life, will determine where we are going to be during those world events. And at some point, we're going to leave and see everything from above. Or if we are not believers, we're going to be here and suffering through. Our decision now determines our location then. While these already determined and prophesied events are going to take place. Look, the whole book of Revelation is there. We know what's going to happen. The question is, are you going to be like John that was taken up on the fourth chapter? Are you going to stay here and be blinded, tormented, and then get to the point where faith in Christ will cost your life? Because you weren't smart enough to believe when you had the chance. Folks, uh, Paul said um, that, well, the writer to the Hebrews actually wrote that uh, we did not really fight all the way to, 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 to blood. You know, there is so much that the Lord, uh, that Jesus himself went through that we, we don't have to. I mean, we, we're going to be having some freedoms taken from us. We're going to see a new world order. It's already around. We're watching it. We're not blind to see it. But what are we doing when we see all of these things? Trying to exhaust ourselves on changing things that we already know that will have to be here? Or deal with the eternal things that can change your location in everybody else's location when those set events are already going to take place so i want to encourage all of you to understand that the, the race is there set before us but we have a blessed hope and for those who await his appearing he will come the second time not for the issue of sin of course but he will come to redeem our body. As 1 Corinthians 15 says, our body will change. And boom, at the last trumpet, we're going to be taken out of it. Not the trumpets of judgment of revelation. That's a different one. And we're going to be taken out of here in a twinkling of an eye. And we will meet the Lord in the air and be with him forever and ever. Father, I thank you for your word, for your plan, for your wisdom, for your sovereignty. And as we see what's going on around the world, we ask that you will remind us of the blessed hope every day. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance towards you and give you his peace. May the peace of God be with you. And that's the peace that can only come from the Prince of Peace, who is the Lord of Peace, who can give you peace now and forever, here and everywhere. His name is Yeshua. He is the salvation and he is the a glory of his people Israel, and a light of revelation to the Gentiles. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Folks, if you haven't done so, download Telegram. I give daily updates on Telegram. You download it. You find Amir Salfati. You see I've got already 31,000 followers. Join 
and you'll receive audio messages, video messages, and of course, written messages every single day. I'm no longer on Twitter. I'm on Telegram. It's easier, faster, better, and more secure. And nobody is shadow banning me over there. Until then, um, God bless you and shalom.